Why do we sing songs? Why do we go through this formality when there are churches that do not do that? So, but why do we do it? Why does the believer need to have praise and worship in their life? And as I discussed with you last week in my studies, I realized that praise and worship was really built off of the foundation, first of all, of thanksgiving. That before you can ever get into thanks, uh, really to get into praise, you've got to understand that thanksgiving now becomes the foundation by which we grow into intimacy with God. So in other words, how am I ever going to praise somebody if I'm not first thankful for what they add to my life? So we utilize this thought process that praise and worship seems to be what I'm discovering right now. There seems to be a connection between my relationship with people as well as my worship before God. I'll give you an example. How can I thank God for how good he is to me if I never stop to recognize that he's using people all over the place to be good to me? In other words, I got to recognize that I, I don't stand alone in this world. It takes a lot of people to support my life. And if you look at your personal life, your personal life is supported by a lot of human beings. So when's the last time that you'd stop and tell them thank you? How many times recently have you stopped to give them honor because of their place in your life? But that's just a foundation because now we're going to move into an area of what we call praise. And praise is, as we talked about this morning, I mean, Kristen was right on line with the, from, with, from my point of view with the intention of saying that you should be intentional. But, you know, it's like giving. Giving should start at home. And if you really want to do it right, you start at home by not just writing a check out this morning and just plopping it in the bucket. You already know that there's income that has come into your home. So now inside of yourself, you make a mark. Remember we talked about this song, this song earlier that I make a mark of my heart like a tattoo on my arm. It's set forever that my heart needs you. So it's the same way with, with, with my worship, my thanksgiving, and my praise that I have to give place to it intentionally. I'm going to give intentionally with thanksgiving. So my whole concept now, in, in this has been my, my vision that I believe I woke up with, was that I've had this in my life a few times. And I'm going to be honest with you, not enough. So I'm going to share with you out of my own life some things that have happened to me, not enough, but a few times. Where I've been in my living room and I've looked across my, my family and God opened my eyes to how good they were to me. And then I stopped to thank him and then to thank them. And then there's been another time when he just didn't show me how good he is to me by them. He also showed me the value of that person in my life. Now, you understand, it's a little bit different when somebody does something good for you and you recognize it, but then you begin to recognize their value. Because you see, I can never get to a place of receiving their worth if I don't treasure their value. Now, worth is worship, but worship is ultimately intimacy. So when we talk about worship next week, it's ultimately about this. It's coming into a place of divine intimacy with the Father because I recognize his worth, because I'm receiving his worth, because I treasure his value, and I thank him for what he does for me. So you see, most of the church never experiences true worship because they've never experienced thankfulness. They've never taken the time to say, God, thank you that if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have air to breathe. I wouldn't have light in my eyes. You could be blind. You could be deaf. And even if you were, you still give him praise because he can heal you and deliver you. So when's the last time that any believer take the time like in their marriage, you should, and I should. And I realized this morning, like just standing right there, right there, I realized that when I dated, was dating my wife, 
I showed her more value then than I do today. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I can remember dating and, and walking to the other side of the car and opening the car door because she was valued. But now she's just my wife. Now, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be honest. I'm just trying to share with you. Shouldn't she be more valued in my life now that she's my wife than when she was my girlfriend? But I was trying to capture her heart. Well, why am I not trying to capture her heart today? Now, I'm talking about me. Now, don't, don't point fingers at me because you're in this audience too. How much do you treasure people around you? And then we come to church and we ask this question. Why aren't we moved more by worship? Well, first of all, how is my life with people? Because Jesus did make the statement, how do you proclaim to love me whom you've never seen and you can't love the people that you see every day? So it's like this. If you can't treasure those who are around you, do you really believe you can bring praise to the house of God? Oh, just a question. All right. I know you're excited about this. <laughs> So let's talk about praise today, all right? So praise now relates to God's character and who he is to you. Now, what caught my attention was the term relate. The word relate means that I have to, al I have to align myself to him. I have to unite myself from a point of a relationship to him. And then I have to give thoughtful intent to his goodness with words. So when I relate to somebody, that means I can't, they can't be a mind reader to say, well, you know I love you. Well, you what do you mean you, you, you know that you love me? No, love is expressed. Love is passionate. Love shows something. And so you can say all day long, well, I love you, but it's like, you know, what's the difference between your love for a banana and your love for your spouse? Are you more passionate about a banana than you are your spouse or your kids? You see, passion drives you to go deeper and deeper, and it's expressive. You see, I talk this way in front of everybody because I love my wife, but also I'm not foolish enough to tell you that I know that we're all on the same ship and that we all have similar likenesses. So I'll put myself out there to show you my weaknesses so that perhaps it identifies yours. Because really the difference between the happiness in life and non-happiness in life is the way you view something. If you view life as being good, it's good. If you view marriage as being good, it's good. If you treasure it, it's treasured. If you find worth in it, it's worthy. But the moment that you turn the dial, and you know how close this is to being, you know, value finding or fault finding? Boy, it's really, really, really right there. You know how close it is to be praiseworthy and gossip worthy? It's just the tuning of the heart. And it's about how you look at it, how you look towards it. You know, your happiest days could be right before you. But it's how you relate to it. So how do you connect to God? How do you connect to his character? How do you connect to his qualities that separate him from everybody else? How do you connect yourself to God's outward manifestation? That's his character. Well, it goes back to this thought. When I was thinking of character, I was thinking of value. So when I think of God's character, I think of his value. What's his value to me? So when I think about those things, I have to question myself. Am I really bringing praise to the Lord? What's the depth of my praise? It all has to relate to the viewpoint of my value. If I value him highly, thanksgiving can be done inwardly, but praise is the demonstrative things that happens on the outside. Hey, when I'm grateful that somebody loved me, I'm going to tell everybody that somebody did something good for me. 
But you know what's tough about this life and the generation that we live in? You really can't tell everybody what good stuff God does for you because people get jealous. And it should be that the household of faith should be so overflowing with the goodness of God that everybody should be in church all the time celebrating the grandeur of his covenant with you and the expression of his love towards you. He said, why don't we see more of it? Because we don't value it. Now listen, if I've learned this as a married man. The more I treasure that woman, the more I get treasured. You know why? Because I was created by God to be the initiator. And women were created as the responder. Jesus is the head of the church. He's the male figure. We're the bride. He has done it all for us, but do we take enough time to value what he's done for us? So what value is now is the real value of a thing is its utility. So all these things now like come alive to me. So what is the utility? It's the production of good. So to praise God means I have to stop, think, meditate on and come to a plan of why I'm going to give him praise because of his production of good to me. If I don't see how good he is to me, it's impossible for me to bring praise. So the church has been brought up quiet, silent, because we have not spent enough time valuing the move of God in our life. Psalms 34, verse 3 says this, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. The word magnify means you make him greater. You make him greater. You increase the apparent dimensions of his body or his person or his works, the body of his work. You take something that magnifies him. And what's so cool about this, listen to me, when you magnify God, it's not like you're changing what you see. You're only magnifying him and seeing what you've never seen before. You see, revelation, more insight, more increase comes with the more that you magnify him. But it's an intentional thing. You got to take out the magnifying glass. You got to take out any form of magnification. Um, I don't need glasses to read. I don't. I use glasses to see out there for them. But I've learned, man, Rachel's got some reading glasses around the house. And it's like, put them on another thing. Well, this is pretty cool. It makes everything bigger. That's what it's supposed to do, right? So now, on purpose, I put them on on purpose so I can see bigger words. But he also says, now you've got to exalt his name. And he says that means you've got to elevate in power, you've got to elevate in wealth, and you've got to elevate in rank and dignity. These are things that we have to do. So he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. That should be something that we all look to one another and say, hey, when we go to church, we're going to magnify the Lord together. You ready? It's an encouragement. We're going to exalt his name together. Together we're going to do this. Why should I do that? Well, if, listen, let's go backwards a little bit. Let's start at home. It should be that the husband and the wife look at each other and say, hey, today let's magnify the Lord together. Amen. Come on, today let's exalt his name together. Yeah. And what happens is then you're going to create an atmosphere in your home that's now going to breathe life into it. And I guarantee you somewhere along the course of the day, course of the week, you're going to tell somebody, man, we've been praising the Lord and his glory did this and his presence did this. Remember, 2019 is the year of his presence. presence. Well, how do we get more of his presence? I've got to be intentional. We've been told recently a word from heaven came and said the seeds of revival have been given to this church, steward it. So what does that mean? Seeds of awakening, a move of God is in the house, but you got to steward it. What does it mean I got to steward it? I got to watch over it. I got to tend to it. I got to care for it. I got to dream about it. I got to do something with it. So our focus and our attention have to be on God, which means the direction of my affection has to be pointed towards him. And the whole goal is to see more of them. 
The reason that we do these things is I want to see more of them. So how do I do it? I value him. Now, what happens on the backside of valuing anything or someone? Greater intimacy. Every human being in this building was created for greater intimacy. You were created for greater intimacy within your spiritual life, and you were created for greater intimacy within your marriage. If you're not married, you're still created for intimacy. That's why you long to be married. Amen. amen. Now, I know that perhaps you're a little afraid to say amen because your spouse might be sitting by, but it's all right. Just say amen. amen. I'm not ashamed to say amen. I, I mean, I don't even know how old I am anymore. I think I'm 54. How old am I? Raise your I'm 54. I've been married 35 years. I've been knowing this girl since I'm 15 years old. I want more intimacy. And I ain't ashamed to say it. But you know what? We've been working on this for 35 years. Pastor, has there ever been a time you had to change your perspective? Hell yeah! <laughs> I don't even know how else to tell you that. Hell was breathing down my throat, telling me all kind of crap, and I had to say, no! Now, why are you being so crude? I'm not trying to be crude. I'm trying to be real. Because there ain't no righteous stuff coming out of the pits of hell. All right. Let's look at Psalms 34. Are you excited about this? I hope you're getting something out of this. Psalms 34, verse 1. So here's the choice. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise or his valued character will be before me. And it will be in my mouth. All right? I will praise. I will bless. I will honor. How do you bless God? Think about this. He's God. How do you please him? How do you bless him? You value him. You praise him. You drive for intimacy with him in worth. You cannot, cannot, cannot draw from the worth of any human being if you don't value them first. They cannot give you anything if you can't value them. The, it's, listen, until you value somebody, you can't draw from them. And it could be the same person. Listen, I've had people that when they first got born again, they came here and it was like, man, they valued us. And then all of a sudden the enemy came in and the same person that they once valued, they hated and the moment they hated me, they couldn't receive nothing. And the moment they couldn't receive nothing, they were gone. That happens all the day with people all the time. And what was the difference? Value. I'm not going to lose my value. Because once I lose my value, I can't gain the worth. So here's the outcome, I believe, or we could say the fruit of a praising life. Every day should bring victory. If you're going to be a praiser and you're going to carry the value of the Lord inside of your heart, victory is inevitable. Over any area of life. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. Psalms 22, verse 3. You are holy. You who inhabits the praises of his people. All right? Now remember this. I said this a couple weeks ago. The beautiful thing about the definition of holiness is that holiness is so pure, so clean, that anything that comes into the presence of holiness is made holy. Anything, he is so wonderful, so loving, so kind, so good. Anything that comes into its presence, it's not, con in other words, going to conform to the outside world. The outside world is conformed to the holiness of God. So he says, he starts off with, you are holy. And you inhabit the value that you, the people of God, Put on him. So when he inhabits something, there's certain victory. So why am I getting more victories? 
maybe I got to change my perspective. I'm not, look, this is not about, look, this is the year of his presence. How many of you want more of his presence? Amen. All right, so listen, so I, look, look, look at the pastor. I got both hands up. I want more of his presence. So you know what that tells me? Um, I got to make some changes. Because I want more. That means I haven't got all that I need. All, the, all that I want. I need more. So I got to make changes. So what do I do? I increase my praise because he inhabits it. Now here's another outcome to when you really praise the Lord. So we started off with God inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. So when you, the more you praise him, the more you're going to trust him. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and thou delivered them. They trusted in thee, and they were not confounded. Or in other words, they were not ashamed, and that word shame means their trust was not injured. So the more they praised him, the more they trusted him. The more they trusted him, the more deliverance came. <laughs> so what happens with a praising life? You get more victories. But remember, praise is just not, thank you, Jesus. Though, I, like I said before, I'd rather you say, thank you, Jesus, than cussing. But praise you, Jesus, should start from a value system that really means something. Like I'm bringing out my gold. I'm bringing out my praise because this is intentional. I'm here to worship you, to praise you, and it's going to start with thanksgiving. So the more we allow God to fill our lives, the less room there is for trouble. I said the more that we allow God to fill our lives, the less appearance of trouble there will be. So how do I fill my life with more of God? I reflect on His goodness. How many of you know God responds to faith? God responds when you trust him. All right, so now let me shift gears a little bit. I still got a few minutes left, and I'm doing real good on my time. Now, you've heard me now talk about perhaps the church world is not receiving the full dynamics of the outcome of what really Thanksgiving, praise, and worship is like in the church because we haven't yet discovered it amongst ourselves. But when we discover it amongst ourselves, then we're going to know how to bring it to him. Now, I would advise everybody to do this, please. Don't start trying to find value in everybody else when you don't start at home. <laughs> it would be kind of foolish for me to start looking around the crowd and say, Ooh, I find value in her and in her and in her and in her and her and her and I miss out on her. So I better find value at home. Then I will have her permission to give value everywhere. So on the other side though, apparently according to the word, when I praise him, Something happens to my heart. So I believe, listen to me, that your heart and my heart are musical instruments. And when you intentionally find value in God, your heart will sing for you. Your heart will do something for you that perhaps is not doing right now. Let me show you. Ephesians 5, verse 19. The word says, you are to speak to yourself. In other words, you've got to take time and intention to do these things, but you speak to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, where? In your heart to the Lord. Another translation says, we make melody with the heart to the Lord. So now my heart is an instrument that makes music, that pleases God. Well, let's look at the heart, the definition of a heart. The heart is now the foundation and the seat of all of your thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, and affections, and eventually leads you to purpose. 
Now, let's look at these, these terms. Everybody follow along. So the heart now is the foundation and it's the seat to my thoughts. Now, my thoughts will lead me to my passions. My passions will lead me deeper into desire. Desire will take me now into my appetites, and my appetites will get me to my affections, and my affections will get me to my purpose. But it all starts with my thoughts. You see, value is found when you do something with your mind, and you intentionally find value in that which you're looking at. Far too many people find value in stuff. We're to find value in people. So I believe that when your heart and your voice both agree, the heart is the inward side of you and the mouth is the outward value of you. When your inward value and your outward value agree, there will be melody in your heart. So you got to get the inside world and the outside world linked up together, then your heart makes melody. What I found so significant about the, t- the, about the term melody is that it's a succession of sounds. It's a succession so regulated. It is regulated and modulated because it is to please the ear. But it is ordered. In other words, it has purpose. It's order. Somebody has to do that. Somebody has to put this effort into making melody and the Bible says the heart can do it but it doesn't do it by accident it does it by intent it goes on to say that to make melody means to touch to pluck and it's to be accompanied with the lyre or the harp or in other words it's to be accompanied with music so in other words at some point Your love affair creates music. But I want you to look at the term touch and pluck. For me, that word means touch and strike. I was trying to figure out how to do this today, and I couldn't figure it out. But I'll give it to you in illustration. If I'd call Elman up here, or Nick, or somebody who can play the guitar, Chrissy's doing real well right now, and say, okay, play us a melody. They'd have to intentionally touch the fret, touch the strings, apply pressure. And then Elman told me it takes three notes to make a chord. Three notes, and then it has to be struck. It's pleasing to the ear. Everything was intentional. Touch, strike. This is why it's important. I don't know where this came from. If somebody knows, please refer me back to this. But on December 2nd, 2018, which is a Wednesday, is, a, is it Monday? Monday or somewhere, I wrote this down. A prophetic word, what was it? It would have been a Sunday. So apparently it happened in our church service. Because I wrote it out, and here's what it says. Your worship would discover a new opening. Worship within, but express openly. In your worship, you will touch the new living way. In your worship, you will strike the barriers and breakthrough is certain. Breakthrough is certain. Embrace the unknown worship. Touch and strike. Now, when you put it all together, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? Touching people, honoring people, striking things on purpose with good. It's not harm. But what we're trying to show you is that there's this, there's this dynamic that came to us in December that said there's a new form of worship coming. There's a new place of worship. It's something new, and it's going to touch the new and living way. And it's going to strike the opposition. But this sound is going to bring breakthrough. So praise now is this. Praise is the awakening of the value of one's presence. Praise is the awakening of the value of one's activity, provision, value with verbal recognition of one's wealth, and it's public, and it's exciting. It's public, and it's exciting. So when we, when we think in our minds that praise is just this, that's the furthest thing from the truth. 
Praise is not that. Praise is when, for an example, when my children, and I know Bubba sent me some pictures of Thomas. Thomas had a great weekend playing ball this weekend, and um, he's been nominated for, um, what is a student athlete of the week, or Barker Hyundai, just great week. All right, now listen, what I, the reason I said all this is to say that I remember being a parent. And I value my kids. And man, let me tell you something. When they had a base shot, woo! Daddy wasn't quiet. Daddy just didn't go there go. No. There was some excitement and some passion behind it. It was worth with, with Leo. I'd get on the fence and scream, woo! And then Rachel said, you got to calm down, dude. You're a pastor of a church. People are looking at you. So I calmed down a little bit. But the whole concept was that when there's value and you can see the success, there's a shout. And there's more people shouting at the ball fields than ever in church. Come to church, silent. Come to church, no reason to praise. Don't understand the purpose of it. Don't understand the reason of it. I'm trying to give you some reason. I'm trying to give you a purpose. Go home. Think about Jesus. Think about what he does for you. Get some value in your heart. Then come to the house and get loud. Why? What happens? Because when you build something, he comes and he visits with you. Bring an offering. He said, I have nothing to bring. I have no monetary substance. You got your heart to bring. I promise you, if you bring your heart and bring your mouth, your pockets will fill up with good stuff. So praise is both descriptive and it's de declarative or whatever. How you say that? You got it. You're making a decree. Descriptive means it exalts in the person, his attributes and his essence. When you're going to make a declaration, it's about what God has done, and it declares this future glory coming. But I want to make this point, which is the next point, Cammy. There is no impersonal way to express praise. There's no impersonal way. I've learned things from the scriptures on how to talk to my kids. So when I talk to my kids, I tell them stuff like, you see, because I know this is like splitting hairs and I know, you know, but listen, Father God never told Jesus I'm proud of you because there's no pride in him. But he says, I'm well pleased in you. So when I talk to my kids, I talk to my wife, man, you please me, you make me happy. I love you. I honor you. And you know what happens when you give people honor? You get it back. Amen. Well, if it happens that way in the natural world, what do you think happens in the spirit? Draw nigh to God, and what happens? Mm. 